Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to Academia Klimatyczna Climate Talks, which is an independent education initiative. My name is Izabela ratajczak Juszko, and I'm based in Gdańsk, Poland, Europe. The aim of this event is to explain better the idea of interconnection and the importance of global collaboration for climate change adaptation. And uh, now may I introduce our very special guest, connecting from Dhaka, Bangladesh, Professor Salim Ohok. Thank you very much. Our pleasure, um, Professor. Professor Hook is an expert in adaptation to climate change in most vulnerable developing countries and has been a lead author of third, fourth and fifth assessment report um, of the IPCC. And he also advises the least developed countries as a group in the UNFCCC, which is United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This will be a very long introduction. He has published hundreds of scientific as well as popular articles, as well was, uh, as was recognized as one of the top 20 global influencers on climate change policy in year 2019, and a top scientist from Bangladesh on climate change science. Professor Salim Ohok is the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development and professor at the Independent University Bangladesh, as well as associate of the International Institute on Environment and Development in the UK, as well as the chair of the expert advisory group on, for the Climate Vulnerable Forum and also senior advisor on locally led adaptation with Global Center on Adaptation headquarters in the Netherlands. Professor, over you with uh, first question. Um, what is climate change vulnerability? So uh, when we use the word climate change, it usually signifies a short version of a long phrase called human induced climate change. So not just natural climate change, but climate change that is happening because human beings for the last uh, century and a half have been burning fossil fuels, emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which is causing the atmospheric temperature to rise. It has now gone above 1.5 degrees and we hope to keep it below two degrees if possible, 1.5 degrees. But this is now affecting climate uh, effects, weather effects around the world. For example, floods are increasing in intensity. Cyclones and hurricanes are increasing in intensity. Uh, sea level rise is causing problems in low lying coastal zones around the world. Uh, and then temperature rise causes heat waves uh, as you had in, in Europe a few years ago. Um, and these are now happening all over the world. And these are abnormal. They are not normal changes that we have seen for centuries in the past. Now we are seeing abnormal events and they're increasing. And in fact, I would argue that this year, 2021, we have already stepped into a climate changed world. The global temperature has been increased by more than one degree. We are seeing if a extraordinary events all over the world, I'm sure including Poland, but I don't know enough about the specifics of Poland uh, to cite it, but it's happening everywhere. And uh, one other comment I will make about this universal phenomena that is true for every country, that when you start looking at the impacts of climate change in any country, whether it's a poor country like my country, Bangladesh, or a richer country like Europe, if you look at which part of the country geographically and which citizens of the country are the most vulnerable, happen to be living in the most vulnerable area and are themselves most vulnerable, almost always you will find poor people of that country, the poorest people of that country, whether it's a rich country or a poor country, the poorest people are living in the most hazardous area, the most risky area, they are being affected by the impacts of climate change. So there, even though climatic changes occur very specifically in very location specific ways, 
every country is different, every place is different. There are some common elements. And one of the common elements is that the most vulnerable in any country tend to be the poorest people in that country. So what you're saying is um, poverty makes some communities more vulnerable to climate change, is that right? Absolutely, and there are two dimensions of poverty. The one dimension is location. Poor people live in hazard prone areas. They can't afford to live in safe areas. Uh, so in the lowest part of the, the coast or the river uh, or in the, the heat uh, uh, zones, they are the ones living there. And then because they're poor, they don't have money for air conditioning in heat waves or uh, uh, having facilities to uh, protect themselves from the impacts of climate change. So when climate change happens, they get badly affected, whereas richer people can adapt better because they have resources to do that. So that's an interesting concept because, because we are talking about communities, not so much about countries. Uh, but let me ask you, could you tell, tell us more about most vulnerable developing countries as a group? What I mean is um, this is related to climate change negotiations. Sure. So in the global negotiations on climate change, which involves uh, roughly 200 countries, there are uh, specific sets of countries that are recognized as being particularly vulnerable. One of them are the poorest countries. They're called the least developed countries, nearly 50, including my country, Bangladesh. And as you mentioned earlier, I work very closely with this group. It's a, it's a formal caucus group in the negotiations. They negotiate as a, as a block of uh, 50 countries currently chaired by Bhutan. And I advise them on the negotiations. And then in addition to the least developed countries, there are small island developing states like in the Pacific or in the Caribbean. They have another group. They are called the Alliance of Small Island States. And then a third group are the continent of Africa. Africa as a whole is particularly vulnerable. So the whole continent of Africa is considered a vulnerable uh, group and they, they also negotiate as a block. And the fourth block of countries are in Latin America. Uh, they call themselves ILAC. They're a group of about 30 or 40 countries. So these four groups are recognized as the most vulnerable. There are overlaps between them, like many of the LDCs are also in the Africa group. If you take the overlaps into account, then roughly 100 countries, which is roughly half of uh, the global total, are vulnerable uh, to the impacts of climate change. Thank you very much for that explanation. Um... We quite often talk about adaptation being a local issue. Uh, just recently, I followed the uh, Climate Adaptation Summit at uh, what, what I understand you've been part of it as well. And um, what I've heard was a kind of new concept or maybe frame, framed in a new way, uh, which is called locally led adaptation. Please, could you explain the concept of locally led adaptation and perhaps indicate are there connections between a family living in Asia, let's say in Bangladesh, and a family living in Europe, in Poland? Thank you very much, Isabella. So let me um, go back a little bit and tell you a little bit about what my institute has been doing for a number of years. Uh, we work on locally led adaptation. It was initially called community-based adaptation, working with uh, 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 communities that are vulnerable. Now the phrase has changed to locally led adaptation. And as you said, it's part of the global summit on adaptation, which was organized under the, uh, the chairmanship of the prime minister of the Netherlands. They set up a big high level commission. They did a lot of work on this. And so my specific role has been on locally led adaptation. And by that, what we mean is, as I mentioned earlier, the most vulnerable communities in every country, even in rich countries are now being affected by the impacts of climate change. And they are having to tackle it, having to adapt to it as best they can with support from wherever they can get it. Now, what we do uh, in Bangladesh, we have been working with other countries in our region in South Asia and across the least developed countries. We have a network of universities in particular that we collaborate with in the least developed countries. It's called the LDC Universities Consortium on Climate Change or LUC or LUCCC and also a consortium in Bangladesh, which we call Gobeshana. Gobeshana is a Bangla word for research. And over the last six years, we used to have a 
a big annual conference every January where we brought together uh, people from the region and also from the other countries to share experience on locally led adaptation. This year, because of the COVID pandemic, we made it a virtual event. And because we were virtual, we tried to make it a global event and we invited participants from all over the world to share their experiences. And we got a huge response. We had more than 90 sessions that we ran over seven days, 24 hours a day. We had eight hours. Absolutely, it was amazing. I don't know if anybody's ever done this before. Uh, I think not, I haven't heard of it. But we did eight hours for Asia Pacific region, then we shifted eight hours for Africa and Europe time zones. And then we shifted eight hours for the North America, Central America, South America time zones. And then we went around the world again and again and again for seven whole days, 24 hours a day. And we had a tremendous response and people from all over the world shared their experiences. And the answer to your question is that even though the problems are very local, the solutions can be very useful to learn from each other. Uh, what people are doing in Poland would be of interest to people in Bangladesh. Uh, I'll cite one example. We had a very good discussion with the, uh, the officer of Providence uh, uh, in Rhode Island in the US. And again, the, men the point I mentioned is that in their, in their city, which is trying to develop an adaptation plan, they are finding the same thing. The most vulnerable communities in that city are the people of color living in the poorest part of the town. These are the immigrants. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the universality of the most vulnerable being the poorest and the most neglected citizens of their own country is a universal phenomena. And so what does that mean? It means that any effort to do adaptation, whether it be at the national level in a country like Poland or in Bangladesh or at the global level needs to target these uh, local uh, communities and prioritize them and particularly give them the opportunity to develop their own strategies. And that is what we are lacking at the moment. That's why locally led adaptation means enabling the local communities to lead to tell the national authorities what they need and what they want, rather than being told what to do, which is what is happening right now. That's right. So I finally know one word in your language, which is Gobeshana. And uh, I, I think this is what we should be all doing. We should um, share research and talk to each other. For example, nature-based solution, that's, uh, that's an issue on, on the agenda, which is nothing new, actually. It's something that we have been all doing globally. Uh, but it has sort of a new uh, label that it's, uh, it's part of new adaptation movement. Here in Gdańsk, we, are, we have so many examples of nature-based solutions that we could share with some other colleagues around the world. And we would be very happy also to learn something from, from others. So that's something to keep in mind for the next year, for the Gobeshana 2020. Yes. You, have, you have invitation to, to participate next year. Thank you very much. Uh, let me move to the fourth question. Um, that's again going back to climate change negotiations. Um, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about loss and damage mechanism and I'll, I'll just explain a little bit what, what it is. Because it was um, established here in Poland during negotiations in 2013 during the COP in Warsaw. And uh, the full name of it is the, the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage, usually called loss and damage. Uh, which is a climate policy mechanism dedicated to dealing with uh, climate related effects in highly vulnerable countries that face severe constraints and limits to adaptation. So I, what I wanted to ask you is, uh, because you're advising um, uh, vulnerable countries during the negotiations, what in your opinion, what challenges ahead we face for, loss and, for the loss and damage mechanism? Thank you uh, for that question. Let me start with a sort of um, describing the progress that we have made. So we have made some progress. Uh, it, it's a very highly contentious and politically sensitive issue because the developed countries who are the major polluters uh, fear the use of the terms liability and compensation. Uh, in fact, those two words are taboo. They are not allowed to be used. So loss and damage is a euphemism to talk about liability and compensation without talking about liability and compensation. And you know this very well in the work that you have done in the past with us. But 
in Warsaw, in COP19, when we were in Poland at Warsaw, we had a major breakthrough. Uh, the breakthrough was that these developed countries who for 19 years until then refused to talk about this issue, finally agreed. We got them to agree and they set up what you have just mentioned is the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage, which allowed us to talk about this issue. So we set up an executive committee, they had a work program, and they did some very good work at the scientific level. What does it mean? How do you describe it? How do you work on it? What are the options to deal with it, uh, et cetera? So some good scientific work was done. And then last year in COP25, when we were in Madrid, in Spain, there was a agenda item to review the Warsaw International Mechanism and to decide whether to continue with it, if, to con if we continue, then how to continue. Uh, because in the original COP19, it had a, a limited time life. It wasn't a permanent uh, uh, setup. It was a limited time setup and we had to review uh, the progress in, in COP25 in Madrid. And, and the Madrid result was from our point of view, the vulnerable countries point of view, a partial success and also a failure. The success part was in our demand for a much bigger technical assistance element in the Warsaw Mechanism. Right now, it's, it has just an executive committee with very little budget. They can't do very much. We want a much more full-fledged technical wing, and we got that. It is called the Santiago Network on Loss and Damage, uh, Santiago being the, the capital of Chile, which was the co-president of the COP25. As you know, it was originally supposed to be in Chile, but it got moved to Spain in Madrid and the COP presidency was Chile and, and Spain as well. So Chile is the COP presidency and named it the Santiago Network. And that's a very good thing. And that will be on the, the agenda for discussion. And we are now preparing to see what do we want in this network? What does it consist of? How can it be fleshed out? How can it be capacitated to do things? And then after that, uh, the second uh, demand that we had, which, which was for funding a loss and damage, financing loss and damage, paying people who are suffering from loss and damage, that we didn't get. And uh, in, in fact, if you remember, Madrid went over time for two days. It was supposed to end on a Friday evening. It went all night Friday, all day Saturday, all night Saturday into Sunday. And even then it didn't finish everything. And this was one of the items it did not resolve. So no funding, agreed. So. Going forward to COP26, we are going to work on the funding aspect uh, from the developing countries, the least developed countries and the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And uh, we are going to uh, make the case, uh, which is going to uh, um, say what I have uh, earlier said, that the year 2020 was not only the year of COVID-19, it was also the year in which we have moved into a globally warmed world. The impacts of global climate change are being felt all over the world, cannot be denied. Wildfires in Australia, wildfires in California, hurricanes in Louisiana, 30 hurricanes hit Louisiana this year, unprecedented. Floods in Europe, everywhere, Every, anywhere you look in the world, right now they're having snowstorms in the Northeast of the United States. So winters are getting worse, summers are getting worse, um, hurricane seasons are getting worse, flooding seasons are getting worse everywhere whole world, no denying. So 2020 is the warmest year in the world. We will always remember every year from now is going to be even warmer. So we will think of 2020 as the coolest year for the future years. So we have moved into a globally warmed world and loss and damage is happening. It's beyond adaptation. We have tried adaptation, but we have not done enough adaptation. So now it is happening. So in that case, we do need to discuss how to deal with loss and damage. It cannot be ignored anymore. So we will be taking this up. Uh, as you know, we do a lot of work with the negotiators prior to the COP, try to talk to them informally, particularly the developed countries. You have been part of this uh, with us uh, in the past, uh, uh, having informal discussions. This is a good way to prepare for a, a, a good COP decision. If you have good informal discussions in advance, you understand each other without negotiating, you just get to uh, get clarity on what it is that the other side is talking about and how can we find a compromise that everybody can agree on. Then we have a good result at the end when we come to the COP. But if we don't prepare the ground, 
then we just shout at each other and we have no result. And that's unfortunate and, and that's not what we want. That's right. Quite often we talked about the trust among the negotiating groups. Um, I'm just um, thinking about COVID-19 challenges or post-COVID-19 challenges in terms of budgets. And uh, what do you think, what are key roadblocks ahead? Um, having that post-COVID era in mind towards implementation of Paris Agreement. How can we get over it? Is it, is it possible at all? Or is this a real roadblock? I, I don't think it's a roadblock at all. It, it is a roadblock in a sense of a mental roadblock. We think we want to go back to the old ways. We cannot go back to the old ways. We have to go back to a new reality, build back better, greener development. So everything has to be different. We don't need extra money to do that. We can use whatever money we have, but we have to use it differently. And that is the biggest roadblock is accepting reality has changed. The future is different from the past. We don't want to go back to the past because if we go back to the past, we will just repeat these mistakes over and over again. You know, this is not the last pandemic that's going to hit us. There are others that will come around and we are not prepared for them. So if we change our thinking and start thinking with a new perspective, then I think that we can definitely overcome uh, the hurdles of the pandemic, the economy, and tackle climate change at the same time. They're all win-win strategies when you start to think about it. And the good news is countries are trying to do this. New Zealand is taking it forward. Costa Rica is taking it forward. Even the United States now under President Biden is talking about this. We haven't done it yet, but they're talking about it. That's right. And we're all looking forward to welcome the US delegation at the UNFCCC again. And I was wondering what's your opinion? What is, uh, in your opinion, the, the current role of the US to play? Well, the US is always a key player. And when we have the US on board, it's a good thing. We make progress. And then for the last four years, we had them uh, leave the Paris Agreement, although they were still in it officially, and, and they kept us back. So a lot of uh, progress was hampered over the last four years under President Trump. The good news is under President Biden, this is being reversed. The first thing he did as he, uh, after he was sworn in is he uh, asked to rejoin the Paris Agreement. He has appointed some very, very good senior people, uh, uh, John Kerry as his special envoy. He was the Secretary of State in Paris. He negotiated the Paris Agreement on behalf of President Obama at that time. Very knowledgeable person, very uh, experienced diplomat. So we are looking forward to having him back, uh, working with other countries and joining them. Uh, my one um, sort of word of warning uh, to the optimists in the US is that, uh, you know, they cannot afford, they cannot uh, leapfrog and claim to become leaders overnight after four years of being laggard. So they have a long way to catch up with the rest of the world uh, and the harm that they did before they can claim to be leaders. We want them to be leaders, but you know, just uh, asserting and saying that they're going to be leaders is not going to be good enough. They're going to have to do things uh, to prove that they are leaders. But the good news is that even on the domestic front, if you look at the domestic activities that are being put in place, the senior people who have been appointed and a cross government approach to tackling climate change, these are all new uh, and, and uh, good signs. So let us see, we hope that the US will genuinely become a leader going forward and then join with China and European Union and other countries. And we get more momentum. As I said, the COVID crisis should make us move faster in this direction rather than slower. That's right, very nicely put. Um, I'd like to ask you on the last question, which um, perhaps might surprise you, but uh, I, I, I will try to teach you how to say um, climate change in my native language. But okay. please go ahead first. Can you teach us how to say climate change in your language? Sure. So climate change in Bangla. So incidentally, in, in Bangladesh, the English word climate change is probably better known than the Bangla version, which had to be sort of created by the linguists. Uh, so the, the Bangla version is called Jolobayu, which Jolo is Bayu. Uh, Jolobayu. Uh, uh, and that is uh, the, you know, the, the land and water. Uh, 
and then poriborton. Poriborton is change. Poriborton. So jolo, jolo bayu, poriborton. Jolo bayu, bayu, poriborton. That's right. Would you like but to as I said, Polish? you know, it's a, it's it's it, yes. I in a minute the uh, the the Bangla version is a long, complicated you know word even for Bangladeshis. It's not a generally uh, a known word. So climate change is much simpler. Two syllables. Climate change. You know, even farmers in Bangladesh, you talk to them, Jolovayu Puribortan, they don't know. So climate change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, okay, so the Polish version is zmiany um, klimatu. Zmianek klimatu. It's z, z. Zmianek klimatu. Zmianek klimatu. Okay, thank, good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for telling us um, all, uh, sharing with us all your comments on climate change negotiations as well as climate climate vulnerability. We we shall uh, consider joining you next year for next year for Gobeshana and um, we'll stay in touch and learn from each other. Thank you very much. We appreciate your work and we send our best so regards to all people in Dhaka. Thank you very much, Isabel. Before we close, can I just add one last comment? And it goes back to your earlier question about how do we link uh, the households and people in Poland with Bangladesh. I'll, I'll tell you one very important link, which is also a new development, which is young people, the youth around the world now, in Poland, as well as in Bangladesh and all over the world, uh, under you know Greta Thunberg, the Swedish uh, uh, teenager who started this movement in the schools, this is now linked across the world. Everybody, young people everywhere, every country know about climate change. They want to do something about climate change. They are trying to get active in uh, doing something locally, also connecting across borders. So young people are a very, very good connection across the world because it's a global problem. Even though there are local issues and problems as well, they are all part of a global problem and we have to tackle the global problem. And only by global action will we be able to do that. And so we can't depend on the UNFCC and governments negotiating to do it. You know, They've done this for 25 years and it hasn't helped very much. Made a little progress, but not enough. So young people in my mind have a big role to play. And I hope that next year, uh, with your involvement in the Gobeshna, we'll also try and bring some young people from both sides uh, together to talk about how they can join forces and in solidarity with each other and deal with the climate change problem, each from their own place, but working together. Thank you very much. Uh, I should also add that Gdańsk is a place, it's a city in Poland where solidarity movement started. Of course. For of democracy course. in the Europe. Famous solidarity. Exactly. That's right. So now climate change is also about global solidar solidarity, not Absolutely. only global, but in terms of communities as well. Exactly. But also building on what you just said about uh, in uh, younger than myself uh, generation. Mm -hmm is uh, I must say that uh, here in Poland there is a pretty strong group um, working uh, with the Ministry for Environment. They work as an independent uh, committee advising Ministry for, sorry, not a Ministry for Environment. We have a new Ministry for Climate. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are advising, um, and it's an independent uh, um, uh, group, apolitical. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm watching them and following them, what they are doing, and I will pass your Very invitation good. to them. Please, let's link up with them if we can. Very good. Thank you very much. Today at uh, Academia Klimatyczna, we hosted Dr. Salim Ohuk from, da from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Isabella. Nice talking to you. All the My best. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.